Good morning. Happy Easter. He is risen. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. Luke 17. Turn your Bibles if you brought them. Just good to have you here. And um, what a gift it is to be together, to hear one another sing, to hear one another's, uh, the voice of optimism and hope that's there. And uh, it's so cool to be together. So good to have you here. Um, so as many of us have probably uh, experienced, you know what, probably 2020, did we spend maybe a little bit too much time behind the computer right because of the pandemic? Um, in April 2020, the number one question asked, and this is in the UK, number one question asked of Google was this, when will McDonald's open? I mean, come on. Are those the things that we strive for and hope for and long for? Like, Lord, I'm in a pandemic right now. What could be the greatest question on my mind? When does McDonald's open back up? Here's what's interesting. The, the two words Googled the most in 2020 worldwide. Two words, hope, prayer. Two of the most searched out words in the world in 2020. Hope and prayer. And doesn't take us long to understand why. We have all experienced uh, some probably moments of despair, discouragement, depression. And uh, I come to you with a message that's probably going to conflict with, with that because as all of us, you know, we're going to talk about the kingdom today and what kingdom you're a part of. And I'm going to tell you something that the kingdom of God is here, but you're going to be reluctant to believe it because of what we're going through. You know, kind of like when John the Baptist was in jail and he sent his disciples to go ask Jesus, are you the one? Because the way things are unfolding, it doesn't seem like you're the one. The way things are kind of playing out in our world, we're going, Pastor Scott, you're saying the kingdom's come, but I'm looking around me going, is this, is this it? Is this really how the kingdom of God is coming. I mean, we all know the Lord's prayer, right? Your kingdom come. And if we're, we're saying Jesus is the one who brings the kingdom, we're sitting going, is this really all you got, God? Because I can think of some other, other things that would bring me maybe a little bit more hope or optimism. I mean, there's so much confusion, right? I, how many have honestly asked, Jesus, really, are you the one or are we to wait for another one? Let me, let me hopefully quell your fears, quell your questions, quell your hopelessness, because while the latest events don't make us hopeful, and I'm, I'm asking this, the same as you, does the presence of the kingdom, I thought would put it into racism. I thought a, the presence of God's kingdom would put an end to violence, would put an end to global pandemics would put an end to rampant unemployment. I mean, I thought God's kingdom would put an end to those things, but it doesn't look like his kingdom's playing out the way Jesus had told us it would. And this confusion, there's, there's nothing new in this. And this is why I'm ever hopeful, ever optimistic. Four things I want to share with you this morning. So if you brought a pen or a pencil, you got an outline, I want you to jot these things down because these are so important. This is my gift to you this morning. It's called perspective. It's called how do we keep the right things in view even when things around us don't seem to make sense. I'm going to let you know God's still working. He's working today just he was like he was 100 years ago, just was 1,000 years ago, just, was, just the way he was 2,000 years ago. When people were going, Jesus, really? Is this what the kingdom in, entails? We've got to get things right about the kingdom because God wants you to be a part of his kingdom. And we get to navigate that this morning. This is why Jesus in Luke 17, verses 20 and 21, if you don't have your Bibles, look up on the screen. We're going to have these verses for you. He says, being asked by the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders of the day, who should have known everything about the kingdom of God, but they didn't. Because they, were, they, were, they lacked perspective. They, they lacked understanding. When the kingdom of God would come, they, they, they asked him, Jesus, when would the kingdom of God come? And he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, behold. But he says, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Some translations say, the kingdom of God is within you. So there's some things to understand that sometimes the ways of God are not our ways. Can I get an amen from somebody? 
And oftentimes we come to a time like this together and we've got our preconceived notions. We have, our, we have our understanding of what we think the kingdom of God looks like or the work of God, what, what God how God works is, is according to what we've been taught or what we've learned. Hopefully this morning we turn everything you've understood about the kingdom of God on its head. Because we need that today. You need your world to be radically disrupted. Because this is not about what you believe. This is not about your perspective. This is about what God has already established. The first thing is this, Jesus' kingdom is an always forever kingdom. You need to understand the kingdom has always been because there's always been a king. And that king is eternal. That king is timeless. And that king is totally self-sufficient, self-existent, and he doesn't need to create anything. God is God and that's all that's ever been. He is the uncaused cause of the universe and he didn't need to create anything and yet he did. And here's what the psalmist declares in Psalm 103, verse 19. The psalmist says this, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. What this means is that there is no beginning, there is no end to God's kingdom, simply because God is, he is the great I am, he has always existed, therefore his kingdom, whatever he should create, he rules over. He doesn't even need anything to, to be created to, to be the ruler, he is the king. And this kingdom has always been with us. It is eternal. It is primordial. It will come from forever and will go for forever. You can't escape it. You can't outrun it. You're never outside of it. This is why in Acts 17, Paul says, In him you live and move and have your being. So here's the real realization is that God is king and we live in his kingdom and there's no alternative. You are guest in God's kingdom. But that's not enough. Because what has happened is that because of the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3, we've rebelled against his rule. And mankind since then has had this insatiable pursuit of finding the, the perfect true king, and yet the true and perfect king in our eyes have, has always let us down. Let me be the spoiler of bad news. Trump is not the perfect true king. Can I get an amen from somebody? Let me, let me spoil some other people's uh, uh, thoughts today. Biden is not the perfect and true king. Can I get an amen from somebody? No man or woman who has ever been created, who has entered this world from on old or into the future, is never the true and perfect king. Only God is the true and perfect king. And yet until we understand, pol politics are not going to save you. Military is not going to save you. A fixed economy is not going to save you. When we stop evaluating each other because of the color of skin, is not going to save you. And we don't come to that one and perfect king. You're going to continue to have this insatiable pursuit of the one perfect king. And if it's not God, you're going to end up hopeless. Yeah. This is what Israel did, right? They said, we want a king just like the other nations. And God said, what, you're not satisfied with me? And he said, go ahead, point for yourself a king. And they did. And now there's this domino effect of disappointment. Because God wants you to understand he's the true and perfect king. Nothing else will satisfy. The reason the Pharisees asked Jesus a question about the kingdom is because they thought their Messiah would overturn the Roman government. They thought their Messiah would drive out all the pagans in the nation. They thought their Messiah would bring this rule of law and uh, and righteousness and justice to the, to the kingdom. And, and Jesus says, you got it wrong. You need to come back to the one in whom you live and exist and have your being. This is God's world. You're guest in it. But that's not enough. See, if I merely left you there, we are still hopeless and in despair. Second point, Jesus' kingdom is an inside-out kingdom. Meaning, you don't look to the government, you don't look to the army, you don't look to your, your bank accounts, you don't look to um, your, your spouse, you don't look to your children, you don't look to your neighbor, you don't look to your car, you don't look to all your possessions, you don't look to anything external to save you because the problem's not external, the problem's internal. See, the kingdom that Jesus brings is an inside-out kingdom. This is not about our world, this is about our hearts. And the moment you think that 
praying like, God, change our world, change our world. Here's what God's saying in response. I'm not going to change the world until I change your hearts. This is an inside-out kingdom. This is not only an inside-out kingdom, but the way the kingdom works is an invisible, silent, quiet kingdom. It doesn't come with, like, clanging cymbals, and it doesn't come with a marching band. It doesn't come with loud horns. If you drive an import car, maybe it's not a loud horn on your car, but it doesn't come that way. Don't they sound kind of wimpy? But Christ's kingdom is here, and it's moving among us. His kingdom is actually right now being established in hearts in this room. But you're sitting there going, where? And I go, I don't know, because I can't see it. (laughs) John chapter 3, Jesus is talking to one of the religious experts. His name's Nicodemus. And says, Nicodemus, the way the kingdom works is silent. Like the wind where you can see the results of the wind, but you can't see the wind. And it's moving. Christmas Eve, we were here together. And there was a woman here who came to know the king that night. And it wasn't like some light that shone upon her. There she is! There wasn't like this marching band that surrounded her like, yeah, like Mardi Gras or something, right? Like, no, there was a woman sitting here in the quietness of this place and the kingdom of God was being established in her heart. Somewhere in that vicinity, so that be careful over there, guests. <laughs> I think the kingdom is really active on this side of the coffee house. Maybe not so much on this side. We're going to pray for this side over here. Right? But here's the thing. The kingdom, is, the kingdom is being established right here, right now. In some way, we don't see it, but it's happening. Because this is how the king who rules over his creation works. He comes into the heart that you have, that he has created And he establishes something about truth. He establishes something about objectivity. That you know that this world consists of more than your feelings and your emotions and your opinions. That deep down inside you resonate with the message that Christ is who he said he was. And he did what he said he was going to do. And he is not a dead Messiah, but he's a risen Messiah. And and his kingdom is going to work in quiet, silent ways in the hearts that are here this morning. And I've been praying for your hearts. Because I want you to understand that God is not going to clean up the mess of this world until he cleans up the mess of your life. See, he is a God who's not interested in politics. He's a God who's interested in the spiritual realm. He's not a God who's just interested in Jewish people. He's a God who's interested in the universe of people. This has nothing to do with sexual orientation or color of your skin or political parties. This has to do with saying, how is God going to work in my life? And he is. He is. How close the kingdom is right now. You may not be a person who goes to church. I want you to know you're okay. You may go to church twice a year. I want you to know that's okay. But it's not the location of where you're at, it's in the presence of the king that you are always with. In him we live and move and have our being. The kingdom is close, closer than we realize. And yet, it's an ever, it's an ever, it's a, it's a reminder for us that all, want, all God wants to do is he wants to fix your heart. He wants you to know it's okay to not be okay. I want you to know that he works the best in the messiness of lives. Because some of you who are thinking, like, God can't fix me. Here's the God who has power over sin, death, the grave. Here's a God who's created the universe out of nothing. You think he can fix your life? I, I know he can. Stop looking to the future. Stop looking around you and look within. The kingdom is in your midst. And here's the, here's the entrance into the kingdom. Here's where the inside out work of the kingdom begins. You have to believe. You have to trust that you can't do it. Jesus is the way. And I know some of you right now are going, that sounds really narrow-minded. I'm going to tell you right now, don't take that up with me. Take that up with Jesus. Those are his words. I'm just, I'm just the messenger. 
He says, I'm the way. There's no, one, no other way to get to the kingdom but through me. He is the door. He is the way. And so many of us, we, we're trying to find other ways to get in. And you can't. I, part of me wishes there were other ways. But I'm also glad there aren't. I'm a game show fanatic. I don't know about you guys. Are there still game shows on TV? You guys are going to know. I have a little bit of a game show history. I'll talk about that here in a minute. But this past week, you would have thought the game show Wheel of Fortune had committed the greatest blasphemy of all. So Wheel of Fortune. Can we all say it? Wheel of Fortune, nerds. You guys are a bunch of geeks. So the guy at the end, right, poised to win thousands of dollars, Pat Sajak, the host, right, who's still alive. I don't know how, but he's still alive. He says to the guy, and it's totally easy, it's a crossword thing on the, on the board, say it exactly the way it's on the board. And it's four fish. And I forgot the fish, but I'm just going to go for it. So it's a crossword. It's like cod, flounder, catfish, and something. Trout. We'll go with trout. I like trout. Delicious. Oh, you're making me hungry. But he said the fourth fish, but here's the problem. At the end, he inserted the word and, and it wasn't on the board. And Pat goes, ah, ah. He went to the next woman. She read it exactly the way it was on the board without putting the word and in there. She won all the money. These are the rules. Twitterverse lit up. Boy, God, Wheel of Fortune! Kill Pat Satan! Whatever. I mean, the things that people get upset about, right? Like, but here are the rules. We didn't write the rules. Whoever came up with the game show, you need to, you don't put your own words in. It is neat. It needs to be re reiterated the way it's written up there or posted up there. And because the one guy inserted one small little word, he was out. And I think about that, and that is evidence once again the exclusiveness of the gospel is Jesus plus nothing. The moment you come to the table and think, oh, it's Jesus plus this, you are not understanding the inside out kingdom. You come with nothing and you depend entirely on Christ. Remember these three phrases. It is grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. That is the gospel. Do I hear a rewind out there? I do. Grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. Soli Deo Gloria. Amen. Let's, let's learn Latin together. Another time, another place. So once God begins to work on your heart, and this is the kingdom, right? This is why Christ says the kingdom is in the midst of you. Some translations of Luke 17 said the kingdom is within you. Until God establishes the kingdom in your heart, you're never going to be satisfied with a kingdom without of yourself. It's got to be within. Which brings us to our third point. Jesus' kingdom is an upside-down kingdom. Here's evidence that you've come to know the Messiah. He turned your world upside down. Now, who's ready for the world to be turned upside down? I know this is a huge, huge question. But it is a delightful thing. It is a pleasurable thing. It is, a, it, is, it is such a satisfactory thing. When God steps in and says, you've been doing it wrong, and let's be honest, we have, and he steps in and now shows you what rulership over your life looks like. He steps in and says, I'm going to turn your world upside down, and you realize this is the greatest experience ever because he knows what's best for your lives. I read, I think it was a meme, tweet, something. See, God came to earth. We celebrate Christmas. Why? Because we celebrate God with us. He died on the cross and that symbolized God for us. But the resurrection means that God is now in us. And when I tell you that it is an upside down kingdom and that his rulership now plays out in our lives, so many of us think, oh my goodness, how much strength, how much, how much, is this, how much power is this going to require of me to do what he wants me to do? And I'm going to tell you right now, none of your power, none of your strength. It's all of him. Because he's now 
in you through Christ because he's victorious over the grave, victorious over sin, victorious over death. He now gives you the power to live the lives that God wants you to live for his glory, your good. This is why the kingdom is an upside down kingdom. Romans 14 verse 7, Paul says this. This is, this is not to focus on the externals because he says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. This is not about church attendance. This is not about carrying the biggest Bible you can carry or having the most downloads of Bible uh, add-ons your, on your phone. This is not about you know praying certain prayers. I pray four times a day. I pray five times a day. This is not about external acts of righteousness. This is about the fact that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. He's turning your life over from the inside out. And by the inside out, this means he's turning your world upside down. See, this is a God who says to you that you need to understand that you're a Christian first and an American second. Can I get an amen? This means you're a Christian first and a husband second. This is, means you're a Christian first and a wife, a child, an employee, an employer, whatever second. This means the greatest identity you can embrace day to day to day is that you are a child of the king. So therefore, how do I now live my life as a reflection of that? Can I tell you, this is where the rub of faith happens. Just this week, a poll was released that American church attendance is down. Now, I'm going to tell you something, and, and I'm going to show you some of my cards, and I don't want you to think ill of me. But I read a headline like that, and I go, good. Is that provocative? Is that incendiary? I hope so. Church attendance is down. Why would I say that might be a good thing? Because here's why. We've embraced a form of godliness that has denied the power thereof. God will not ask you when you stand before him and you meet him one day, because every single one of us will, how many times did you attend church? More than 50%? 70? Less? That doesn't matter. Church attendance is not how we should measure spiritual growth. Because the upside down principles of the kingdom have nothing to do with your butt sitting in a chair. Here's the upside down kingdom is that people go to church. They've been sold this bill of goods that it's how many times you go to church that matters and that's not it at all. You can never step foot to church again without advocating and still having an awesome relationship with God. This is not about church attendance. And the reason why church attendance is probably down is because there's others who have grown up in households where they saw mom and dad go to church on Sunday and they live for heaven for an hour and a half on Sunday and then they live like hell the rest of the time. And I sit there and go, is that, is that a positive way to showcase the power of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ? No. See, we cannot relegate our lives to an hour and a half on a Sunday. This is not, God expects your world, your life to be turned upside down. Your ethics change. Your morality changes. Your beliefs change. And if they don't, your religion's a sham. He turns your world upside down. And here's what happens. You become more joyful. You become more peaceful. You more, become more hopeful. You become more loving. You become more gentle. You become more patient. You become more compassionate. And if those things aren't happening, you've been sold bill goods. Because when God takes over your life, he changes you. You can sit there and go, he's changed me. And if you don't change, sit there and go, he hasn't changed you. You need to understand that because we've been loved by this magnificent king, you are no longer just mere subjects. You are now dignified vice regents with him. Your position and your identity has changed. Even in Acts 17, verse 6, the, the testimony of what the men were doing, it says, these men have turned the world upside down. This is, this is the power of the gospel message, is that 2,000 years ago, men were witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus. This is one of the objective points of why we believe Jesus is raised from the dead. It's because 12 men changed the world. And men don't live the lives like they did. 
And God is still changing lives and he's still turning the world upside down. And he's doing it because the lives of men and women who have encountered this Jesus, this king, have been changed. Now, for those of you still hung up on the fact that we're not supposed to go to church, Pastor Scott, what do you mean by that? What it means is one of the evidences is that you've been changed by the king and now you're part of the kingdom is now you want to share the kingdom experience with other participants in the kingdom. That's why this is important. But outside of this time, it's also important to be together because now we're on a journey together. We're all undergoing an exodus, just like Israel out of Egypt. We're all enjoying this now exodus to become more and more of what God wants us to be. You have now been given a label. You, have now, you are now dignitaries of royalty because of the king. You like that? That's good. You are now dignitaries of loyalty. And we are now called to live out a life in a world that doesn't understand God, far from God, who doesn't love Jesus. And now through the dignity of our behavior, the dignity of our attitudes, the dignity of our words, the dignity of our works, they all speak to the worth of our king. Don't walk an aisle and accept Christ and live like hell. Don't raise a hand and say, I surrender to Jesus and then live your life, live your life with disregard to what the king demands of you. It is a delightful thing to live under the demands of Christ Jesus. Boy, our society needs this. This is why church attendance is on the decline. Because the world is, has yet to see Christians who truly love the king. As for me and my house, we're going to do that. I hope for me and my church, we're going to do that. And I invite you into the journey. And that's why the, the Sermon on the Mount is so powerful. Because the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, you may want to read that later. There's a reversal of things that we used to hold valuable. Now God calls us to turn the other cheek. How the heck do we do that? He calls us to forgive our enemies. How the heck do we do that? He says to us that the first shall be last, the last shall be first. You don't come to be served, but you come to serve. He reverses the order of what we thought was important. And he is the one who says, oh, wild and wayward son, he's the one we're going to throw the party about. It's all backwards. Why? Because he's turning our worlds upside down. When will the world see a group of people radically changed by the king? When will the world see that family dynamics, business practices, race relations, all of life under the kingship of Christ be a sweet thing? That's what I'm praying for. That's what I'm praying for. And we do it together. When will we give the, the, the world a preview of something that's, that's amazing? I went to the movies the other day. Took my family. We went to King Kong versus Godzilla. So stupid, but fun. So stupid, but fun. Right? You know the moment, like five minutes in, there's so many uh, ridiculous things going on. You're just like, I'm going to eat my popcorn and just watch the special effects. <laughs> part of my favorite part of them going to the movies is watching the previews. And can I tell you, I'm one of those guys, like, my wife hates this, right? I'll watch a preview, and, and when it's totally silent after the preview in the theater, I go, stupid! Right? <laughs> Fast and Furious 16, right? I'm like, stupid! And my wife's like, stop! Because here's the thing, you watch the preview and you're like, I am not going to see that. The preview does not sell you on the movie. Or maybe sometimes it does. Sometimes I'm leaning on my, bro, we're going to see that. Your life is a preview of the movie of God's kingdom. And you're going out into the world and you're showing them a two-minute trailer. Are they saying, boy, I want to know more? Or are they going, stupid! <laughs> do, you, do you understand the weight of that? You are living out, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are living out a small snippet of what the kingdom of God looks like in the life of a person. Are you attracting or are you repelling with the preview of your life? 
We've talked about being a hindrance to the gospel. Let God come into your life and turn your world upside down. Watch what he does. Last point. What we have to understand is Jesus' kingdom is an already not yet kingdom. This is one of the interesting things about the kingdom of God is that as we wrestled in the beginning of the message through like, okay, God, you said your kingdom's here. It doesn't look like your kingdom's working because of all the stuff going on. Well, this is why there's a sense that the kingdom is here, but it's not yet fully here. See, Christ has inaugurated his kingdom, but he has yet to consummate his kingdom. Here's the danger of praying your kingdom come. When God's kingdom fully arrives, it will be a crushing kingdom. My fear is that you will not know the king in a personal way and that kingdom will crush your life. I don't want you to be crushed. I want you to be saved. This is why it's an already not yet. There's still time to love God. Do you not know that his patience is for you to turn and believe? Do you not know that his patience is, is an act of kindness where he says, I could totally snuff all you guys out today. But for some strange reason, we're here. This is why his kingdom is not yet fully consummated because he wants you to be saved. We're praying it comes, but we're also praying that people's lives are changed as a result of it. Because here's what the already part of the kingdom has promised you. And you need to write these two words down. Here's the already. So draw a line under already. Write down this. You are now free from, write this word down, penalty of sin. Second word, power of sin. Here's how we taste the kingdom now. Here's how it's inaugurated. You are free in Christ from the penalty of your sin and the power of your sin. He has declared you free. And he's given you now the power to live a life worthy of his praise. What about the not yet part? We're not yet freed from a world where sin is present. One day you'll be freed from the presence of sin. No more disease, no more sickness, no more tears, no more sadness, no more racism, no more misuses of power, no, no more prejudice, no more... Fill in the blank. See, already we're free in Christ from the penalty and power, but we have yet to be free from the presence of sin. That's what we're longing for. It's coming. But here's the question you've got to ask yourself today is what, so what side am I on? Because it's either Christ's kingdom or your kingdom. And I'm going to tell you right now, your kingdom will be crushed. This is how the story ends. See, I want you to know the already idea of the kingdom that the king has come the king has dealt with sin once and for all the king sits at the father's right hand he now reigns the king's righteousness is now already ours by faith the king's spirit is already dwelling within us the king's holiness is already being produced in us the king brings joy and peace that we've never ever known the king's victory over satan is now already ours and we use the sword of the spirit the word of god to battle this enemy the king's power is a witness now and available to us and the king's gifts are given to us by the spirit and available for all things we need for our marriages and for our families and for our communities this is the already aspect of the kingdom but the kingdom not yet says that I need to learn not to love healing, but I need to learn to love holiness. And I need to learn not to love power, but I need to love purity. And I need to stop loving wonders, and I need to start embracing the will of God. This is what God's doing, because there will be a finality to all this, and God will say, who king did you worship? Will it be King Jesus, or will it be King you? And I'm going to tell you right now, you will lose. And this is the remarkable thing. If I can talk about little Nas X, if I could, on Easter morning. Who just released a shoe. A satanic shoe. It's got a pentagram on it. It's black and red because those are the devil's colors. Ooh. It's got a drop of blood in the heel of the shoe. But here's what's interesting. There's a Bible verse on the shoe. Luke chapter 10, verse 18. Now, here's the interesting thing, because someone didn't 
doesn't know their theology, whoever produced the shoe. It wasn't Nike. They're actually suing the company because it's not Nike. But the Bible verse is this, Luke chapter 10, verse 18. And you know what the, it, that says? It says this, and I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's a loser picture. <laughs> That's like saying, I'm going to wear Seattle Mariners shoes around. I don't know if you're a Seattle Mariners fan. But they got one of the worst records in baseball. I'm sorry, all right? So I have nothing against them. I just had to pick something one arbitrarily, and that's how I chose, right? That's, that's like picking a Yukon shoe. Go Arizona! Who wears loser stuff around? Losers do. Little Nass, you got to do your theology. You got to get better at this. You don't pick a verse. No, wrong, evil, satanic. All right, so here's what you don't do. You don't wear the loser side. Basically, you're buying a shoe going, am I cool? Actually, you're not because you're wearing the loser shoe. I saw Satan fall. Why? Because he's destroyed. He's powerless. He's kicked out. He has no control. He has no authority. He is, the, the, he is God's devil, and God has him on a leash, and the length of that leash is determined by God. The devil's a loser. Why would you put it on a shoe? Someone needs a theology department at that shoe marketing company. <laughs> but yet we're living our lives because so many of us are on the loser's side. Remember I told you about game shows? For some of you who don't know, I was on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire back in 2001 with Regis Philbin. Won the fast finger, got in the hot seat. Out rocking through the questions. Until I got to one question, this 8,000 level question, I thought for sure I could get far past that before I would have to lean on a lifeline. <laughs> so what they have is they have five people and they're all on hold. When you get in the hot seat, they put all the people on hold. So I had a couple friends. I had my brother. I had my mother-in-law, my dad. And uh, a question came up, and I wasn't sure about it. And I don't know who on my lifeline list could have answered it, so I went with my brother, who I'll, I'll see later tonight. And, and there's been forgiveness that's been extended and all this, just to let you guys know. So, um, But he picked the answer that I was going to go with, so I thought, there's a brother connection, Pacific Rim moment, something going on there. And I went with it wrong, ended up free trip to New York for my wife and I, a thousand bucks, hanging out with Regis. <laughs> so I got that going for me. So we did a little party when the show aired. My brother walks in, because we, we got uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire shirt, contestant shirts. He cropped out contestant on his and put lifeline loser. which I make them wear to every family get-together to, th to this day. <laughs> Lifeline loser. And uh, we can laugh about it and we can kid about it, but here's the problem. We all are leaning on Lifeline losers in our lives. God's asking you the one big question this morning, and you're all in the hot seat. I'm not Regis, but you're all in the hot seat. Who is Jesus? He better be the lifeline. He better be your king. Because if not, you will leave here today and you will enter your world of continual disparagement, discouragement, and depression. If you want to know hope, follow Christ with us. Follow me as I follow Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the king. And it is an incredible thing to live in his kingdom. Will you taste today and see that the Lord is good? For those of you who are guests today, we happen to be here on other days other than Sunday, Easter Sunday. But we are here every Sunday, and even my wife and I are here during the week. If you want to come and we'll treat you a coffee and we can talk more about what life with the king looks like, we would love to talk to you. There is hope. There is a future. There is joy forevermore.
And all God's people said, Amen. Awesome. We have a little gift for you as you leave, one per family. May it be a reminder of who this King of Kings really is. Jesus, the risen Lord. He is risen. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thanks for this morning. Thank you for a reminder of your love for us. Thank you that there is still today a day that you extend to us kindness and a day that you extend to us grace and, and mercy and love. And Lord, perhaps today the kingdom is breaking into hearts and minds that are here today and, and working in ways that are not even seen to our our human eye, and we give you praise for that. We're thankful that you're a God who's still at work, who's still moving all things to this incredible consummation where one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I'm praying that every single one of us will do that willingly and voluntarily and joyfully. We want to live in the kingdom of Jesus and experience the pleasure knowing and following him. Lord, thank you for today. Bless this day. Guide our steps. Be glorified in all things. And we pray this in King Jesus' name. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day, guys. We'll see you soon, all right?